Good morning, and I'm Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, and I'm in for Steve Stites today again. Uh, we are coming to you from the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. And in studio today with us is one of our health system chaplains, Clarence Miller, and joining us virtually is Broderick Crawford, President of the New Bethel Church Community Development Corporation. And he has a look ahead uh, to Juneteenth tomorrow, and we also have to my left Amanda Cackler, who will help us answer some of your COVID questions. I think she has some insights into whether our patients that are hospitalized with COVID-19 uh, have had their vaccines yet as well. So before we go any further, let's see what the inpatient numbers are. Hayes has one active infection. Here at the health system, we have 14 active infections, five of those in the ICU and two on the ventilator. We still have 11 of those patients meeting criteria for, um, for recovery. And of those patients, uh, Amanda was uh, very kind to put together. Three of those are fully vaccinated, and three of those fully vaccinated patients, or sorry, one of those three fully vaccinated patients is actually asymptomatic, is here for a different reasons. Two of those patients that have symptoms are partially vaccinated. Um, any more information? You know, a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at this data, we were seeing that the folks that were vaccinated were coming in asymptomatic mm -hmm. and um, yep. typically not related to COVID at all and kind of happenstance yeah. identified that they had COVID-19. Um, today when I was reviewing the um, inpatient numbers, and I think it's important um, to acknowledge even just yesterday, we only had one patient in the ICU. We had a, a couple more now in that ICU status. We've got a couple of them on ventilator. Yep. So they, we are, we're seeing now kind of an uprise in our, our critically ill COVID positive patients. Yeah. Um, the ones that are vaccinated also have some significant other medical yep. conditions mm -hmm. going on. So it's not um, uh, only COVID-19 that they're here for. Um, but it is a little concerning that now we're seeing more yeah. symptomatic and vaccinated folks. To your point earlier, though, some of them had only received um, their first vaccine mm -hmm. or ha it hadn't been that two weeks since their second, so they hadn't been considered fully vaccinated. Um, one of the folks that's in on 61, we actually were able to provide their vaccine while they were here, which is, um, good. It, it doesn't protect them prior to their hospitalization, but should uh, moving forward. Yeah. And we are vaccinating our, our hospitalized patients when we're able to. And like, just like you said, you know, one of those is active chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Another one has significant medical problems mm -hmm. with heart and Cardiac, lungs and things yeah. like that. So, all right, well, uh, before we I jump. I have a question on that. Does that just mean then that maybe their vaccine um, didn't take, or you're saying that they were asymptomatic and they're here for the other things? Well, in, from looking at the charts, what it really seems like is that they have um, worsening medical conditions where maybe the mm -hmm. infection just yeah. led to worsening of their underlying disease. Um, what they are coming in with respiratory symptoms at that point in their hospitalization, I think it's probably difficult to know is it their underlying uh, respiratory mm -hmm. illness, is it their cardiac illness, or is it the infection itself? And I think some of them are, are early on in their um, admission that we hadn't quite discerned which, which is the cause and put them yep. on a cohort unit just to be on the safe side. So it's a good question. And for some of them, I think it may be, we don't know if it's infection related or we don't know if it's related to their underlying medical illnesses. Yeah. And one of the, the partially vaccinated is a chemotherapy, active chemotherapy patient as well. So yeah. And I think yeah, his, he was having symptoms that precluded him from getting his second vaccine because he was, he was concerned about his other medical condition. Yeah. So all right. Great, thanks. All right. Thanks. So back to Jill again. Before we jump into discussion, are there any reporter questions? I don't think we have any this morning. No. We're, All right. We're, we're good to proceed. All right. Well, Chaplain Miller, thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, some of us might need a little history on Juneteenth. How did it get started? And please remember, this is only a half-hour <laughs> show, so give us some <laughs> more of the important high notes. Yeah, so, I mean, as we all know, uh, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in uh, January of 1963, and it took well over two years uh, for uh, the country to see the results of the proclamation. And in Texas, mm -hmm. uh, we find out that many slavers, uh, enslavers actually moved from other states to Texas uh, to continue the slave trade. Uh, soon after the war was over, probably about two years later, 
uh, June 15th, over 10,000 mm. black soldiers uh, migrated to Texas um, and drove out the governor and about four to 10,000 other uh, Confederate soldiers, uh, actually drove them to Mexico. And um, mm. over the next several days, they continued to drive out the uh, different opposers of the proclamation. And it was General uh, Gordon Granger uh, that uh, made on Texas soil, he made the announcement on Texas soil that, um, that slavery has basically been abolished. However, that could have not taken place without those 10,000 soldiers mm -hmm. that were uh, there to help drive out the uh, old regime. So that's how it all came together uh, on June 19th is the actual day that we mm -hmm. celebrated yeah. was the day that um, that they had a big ball as a, or a festival in um, in just thanking everyone who participated in helping the process, and that was their way of celebrating. So that's why we observe uh, June 19th as Juneteenth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, did your uh, family and or friends always celebrate Juneteenth? And if you did, how? As far as I can remember, ever since a kid, yeah, we okay. definitely celebrated all the time. I didn't actually know, uh -huh. as, you know, as a, as a youngster, yeah. uh, of what we were doing. I just know that it was picnics in the park and I'm things like together that. together with people, You yeah. know, and so, um, but as I got older, I understood what it was about, and yeah, we, we have, and there are a number of things that happen um, right here in the city uh, on a smaller level, family-wise, we may come together and we have a cookout mm -hmm. or things like that. Um, on a community level, there are a number of things that happen, like in parks. Uh, there was always a big event at Big 11 Lake, which is here in uh, Wyandotte County, also at um, Quindurl, uh Park, uh, where they would have talent shows, uh, big barbecues, even church services. They would have them outside, and so it's always been a way for us to celebrate. Okay. And how will you be celebrating this year? Same thing? Well, you know, with COVID, it's yeah. been been pretty tough for all of us. Uh, there are a number of things that's going on. I, I've heard one about um, uh, something that's going on in the dot, as they call it, in Wyandotte <laughs> County. Um, and so mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to figure out exactly what to do. Um, there, uh, I haven't put together anything this year. Yeah. Our church isn't doing anything specifically. Uh, but we look forward to, you know, after this pandemic comes to an end, of getting back to some of those uh, things that we've been doing to celebrate the cause. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, if it's not too hot, it'd be great to celebrate outdoors. Yeah. Yes. And it might be another place to uh, continue to endorse and talk with some of those friends or family that may not want vaccination, but right. mm -hmm. maybe it's one way that you can actually promote vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, so why should everyone celebrate this day? Well, no matter what race you are or um, what background you come from, I think that taking time to reflect on how far our country has come uh, mm -hmm. is so important. And I think that's a way to celebrate. It's just reflecting of, you know, where we are now and um, thinking about those sacrifices that others made mm -hmm. that, that we all could have liberty. And, you know, um, one way we can celebrate as if we've been doing it all week with the uh, new national news uh, as Juneteenth being a national holiday, you know, this is something that's been a long time coming. And so um, I think that that's another way to celebrate is just that seeing how as a country we, we have made so many steps to making everyone feel comfortable and wanted here in the United States. Yeah, I think we need to all have compassion for our fellow countrymen yes. and fellow humans, and we're all in this human condition together. So, yeah. exactly. And now we want to bring in Broderick. Um, I know I've known Broderick for a long time. <laughs> great person and um, even when I was really young so so it's good to see you again Broderick how will this year's uh, celebration look for you and for those you serve compared to last year so uh, thank you my good friend good <laughs> Dr. Dana Hopperson is always good to see you sir yeah uh, and yes I might be a few years older than you and and, and as uh, <laughs> Chaplain Miller was talking you know, my family has celebrated Juneteenth as well. But for me, it was interesting because my actual birthday is June the 20th. So for a lot of years, I thought it was just a pre-celebration for my birthday. Uh, but but as we as I've gotten older, and, and certainly we have learned the history of, of Juneteenth and what it has meant, my family actually hails from the South, uh, from Louisiana. And so Juneteenth, what I have learned in Southern states has a greater significance uh, than as you move further north. Uh, as Chaplain mm -hmm. Miller mentioned, there are two events that are occurring, at least two of many 
events that are occurring tomorrow uh, as it relates to Juneteenth. But one thing, again, a couple of things that when you mention what is the significance, one is the fact that it is now officially a federal holiday mm -hmm. and that federal holiday passed with unanimous votes in the Senate and a huge majority in the House. This is one of the few things mm -hmm. that both Democrats mm -hmm. and Republicans did agree on with a majority vote. So that's significant as we address racial injustice, as we address some of the challenges that we have. You, you mentioned COVID, and we know how COVID had adversely affected people of color. And so Juneteenth this year has a greater significance just due to that fact. Second piece then is this is going to be one of the few opportunities that folks have to get outside. And so there will be parades and there'll be all types of activities to allow people to get outside. The flyer that you see now is for the Kansas City, Missouri area where they're going to have character, character, caricature mm -hmm. artists and, and bouncy houses and all those types of kids activities that will be done in a safe way. So they'll be monitoring how many kids are in any particular activity at one time. Uh, there'll be food, there'll be games, there'll be vendors. And that particular event is going to be in the 18th and Vine area between the Greg Kleist Community Center and the South Lawn of the Negro Leagues Museum and KC Jazz Museum. And so that's a huge open area that they will be participating in. The second uh, item that you see there is Juneteenth in the dot. I heard mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Chaplain Miller mention the dot, so he might know a little bit, a little bit of something, something about KCK. We love it. Uh, but yes, mm -hmm. there will be a parade uh, that will take place from from one of the parks and and then go all the way down to the Mount Vernon uh, Center which actually is in the area. I don't know if many of you know, but there literally used to be a university there, one of the first uh, African-American universities, Western universities uh, uh, west of the Mississippi. Uh, that campus is still there, is in need of some repair, but we're working on that. There's a statue of John Brown that still stands there. And so that's where everything is gonna culminate. And so we'll have the parade that goes down the queue as we say, Quindaro Boulevard, mm -hmm. and as we transport uh, uh, down uh, Quindaro Boulevard, uh, we'll then come to a point where there'll be barbecuing, there'll be festival again, there'll be food, there'll be games. Uh, we've got a lot of vendors participating, and this year we're going to feature uh, one of the key historians in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, Chester Owens, and so he's going to give some information. He is actually the Grand Marshal and has just been a phenomenal wealth of information for folks here in Kansas City, Kansas. So we're looking forward to tomorrow. We want to do, do it in a safe way. Our health department will be providing masks uh, for those that choose to have masks. We're trying to work on making sure that we have testing available for those that want to be tested, trying to provide uh, incentives. So really want to have a full day, full event in a safe way for people to enjoy Juneteenth in 2021. Yeah, and kind of speaking of that and going down from the full community down to your congregation, how is your congregation doing with the pandemic and are people getting vaccinated? Absolutely. Uh, New Bethel Church is in indeed one of our, what we call flagship churches, where we had the testing program that was uh, hosted by the uh, Unified Government Health Department. Uh, we continue, we provided vaccines. We had a mammogram event uh, a couple of Fridays ago where we provided both testing and vaccinations. And so our congregation, I'd say we're probably about 75%, if not higher, maybe 80% vaccinated at this point. We have some, as you mentioned, with some health conditions that want to refer uh, with their uh, physicians or their PCPs to make sure that it's uh, safe for them to do so with their current treatments. We do have a large number of cancer survivors in our congregations, and so we want to make sure that things are safe. Speaking of that, we will have Dr. Mario Castro, who will be speaking to our, our cancer group, and so we want to make sure that we get the information out, that we remove the myths, remove the hysteria, make sure the accurate information is out there for our folks to make decisions based on fact and not fiction. 
you know, that's great, the outreach and, and the vaccinations. And we know that during the pandemic, um, there was just so many people and so many appointments that uh, got canceled or left unfilled for those screenings. So the mammogram, mammogram event is great. You know, they just reduced the uh, time that you need to get your colonoscopy. So maybe a colonoscopy event's <laughs> coming up. <laughs> well, but no. we did actually have the cancer center that was there. I'm sure you okay. probably know Brooke Brunneman and, and, and the staff from MCA and KU Cancer Center were on site for that. So we did get some some colorectal screening done. We good, did get good. some PSAs done. So we tried to make it a, a, a uh, full event so that not just breast cancer was being addressed, but all yeah. types of cancer. No, actually, that's great. We had one of your uh, urologists there actually drawing blood and doing PSA, doing DREs. On that's site. good. That's good. <laughs> you know, that's great. And you are always a bright spot here at the health system and in the ID uh, clinic itself. But obviously you had to leave and do these other things for the community and you've accomplished so much and continue to do that. So thank you very much. Um, hold on the line for just a little bit. Um, Jill, do we have any questions from our community? Live we, questions? We do. We have two or three, okay. and I think that they're good ones, so we're going to go ahead and do those before we proceed to our printed ones. Erin wants to know, are the asymptomatic COVID patients able to spread COVID to other people? So for our fully vaccinated mm -hmm. asymptomatic patients, I think that's who you're referring to in that question. We know that the likelihood of transmission is significantly yeah. reduced with the vaccine. Um, is it possible? Yes. Is the likelihood of it happening uh, is, is significantly reduced? It would be my response. Yeah, I think significantly reduced. You know, the, the little bit of information, it's probably 90% or more how much the ability to transmit the disease uh, is reduced if you are fully vaccinated. So that is the, the best information we have to date. Yeah, and I think that um, for those that are fully vaccinated, that's why it's so important to continue to monitor for symptoms. Once you develop symptoms, mm -hmm. um, that's when, per, I mean, I think the CDC guidance is pretty clear to say that if you're asymptomatic, you don't have to do the um, isolation or, or quarantine. Um, but if you are um, having those symptoms, that it is, uh, just with any other illness, a good yeah. idea to, to keep away from other folks. And Joyce was a little bit confused about the numbers and how they were delivered this morning. Mm -hmm. And she says, if you have 14 active mm -hmm. and three are fully vaccinated, is that 21% of your patient population that is fully vaccinated? The, yeah, we have um, of our active infections, mm -hmm. and I, I looked through um, mm -hmm. 13 patient charts, I think, were the, the ones that were on Unit 61 today. Yeah. Um, it, it was about a quarter of them were uh, fully vaccinated, yes. Now, one of them being asymptomatic, yep. the other ones having symptoms. Um, but again, all of them had un other underlying medical condition. And so you don't have otherwise healthy people Correct, who are also fully vaccinated. I know some of our most recent critically ill folks were unvaccinated yeah. um, and otherwise did not have any uh, underlying medical conditions. So um, just definitely something that we're, we're keeping a close eye on. And, and is it possible in those cases that their immune system just didn't respond to the vaccine or was not able to? Yeah, again, we do have one, although partially vaccinated, is on active chemotherapy. We also have two others that have significant uh, comorbidities with heart and kidney issues and lung issues. So there are a lot of things uh, also that could confound some of these symptoms that may or may not be due to COVID itself. Yeah, so devil's in the details. Yeah. All right, another numbers question. Last mm -hmm. one, and then we're gonna to go to the printed one. Angela said that she read this morning that 300 children mm. are having heart inflammation following their vaccination. That concerns her. Can you speak to that inflammation and what are the symptoms? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the myocarditis, pericarditis that we've seen about and heard about. Uh, it's been in the news. You know, I think the CDC or FDA is meeting today to uh, talk about it more and look at more into investigation. But these cases are still extremely rare uh, when you consider all the number of people that have been vaccinated, when you consider the number of 12 and above that have been vaccinated, even in that adolescent. Um, the issues at this point in time look to be uh, non-severe and transient, meaning they last only a, a short amount of time and they resolve on their own. So 
uh, doesn't seem too concerning, very rare, this should in no way prevent you from getting uh, your children 12 and above vaccinated. Again, my children have been vaccinated. My daughter's 12, my son is 14. Very safe overall, and it is going to help protect them uh, against the risk of that multi-system inflammatory disease, of that risk of hospitalization, and even of long COVID. And certainly, we know that um, you know adults struggle with long COVID. We certainly wouldn't want our children to struggle with those types of issues as well. And you brought up your kids. Linda wants to know, how are they doing following yeah, their shots? They're doing great. They're doing yeah. great. They uh, had activities. The Let's see, they got their second dose on Thursday. They had activities Saturday, Sunday, and did well. So no, no big issues. Well, and Linda also says, great role models. Good job, Dad. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. And Peg, she wants us to know that the first annual Juneteenth Heritage Jubilee will be tomorrow morning, 10 to noon, in the city park in Weston. So we have another one. Thank you, Peg, for thank you. Um, sharing that. And Jamie just wants to say thank you to Broderick and to the chaplain yeah. for sharing all the information in the heritage of, of Juneteenth. And Weston's a nice little I, yeah, I love yeah. Weston. It's really fun. Okay, so now time to get down to work. Mm -hmm. First question. The CDC recently recently called the Delta variant a variant of concern. Yeah. Is it more deadly than the Alpha variant? So if you remember early on, the Alpha variant or the UK variant, they said that it was more transmissible and more deadly. Uh, there was a final Lancet paper looking at uh, the UK or Alpha variant, and it did not show to be more, cause more se severe disease or more deadly. We also are learning more about that Alpha variant um, and how it interacts with our immune system and its ability to uh, significantly decrease or reduce our initial immune response to the viral infection. Uh, we can maybe make correlations that this is the same and the same thing is going on with the Delta variant, but unfortunately there just isn't enough uh, basic science research known about Delta variant right now. So we can't really speak to uh, is it more deadly, does it cause more severe disease. If we draw from the Alpha variant uh, information, Alpha variant does not look to cause more severe disease, but investigations are right now ongoing. Basic uh, lab, uh, bench top research, basic science research, but also clinical research into the full extent and the severity of the Delta variant. Are people still dying in local hospitals of COVID-19? When was the last death at the health system? So this is something, and kind of linking back to the previous question, something that we don't know with all of our COVID-19 mm -hmm. cases is which variant did they have. So I think that's something just to keep in mind that we're not um, doing that variant testing on every single one of our COVID tests. So um, hard to know which variant may be contributing to our internal death rates. Yeah. Um, we have had um, and continue to have deaths of patients who have had COVID-19. Our most recent one was um, on the 12th of June. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, again, something, a limitation to the data that I report every day on COVID deaths is I'm just looking at, um, of our patients who have unfortunately died, did they ever have a COVID-19 um, positive test or diagnosis? So I wouldn't be able to tell you specifically yeah. was the cause of death COVID-19. I can just tell you this patient died and also had COVID-19 at some point. Yeah, I think if you were a betting person, you'd be smart to put your money based on national and regional pre prevalence of variants, uh, the variants are probably going to be that alpha or that delta, that UK or that Indian variant, that most people uh, who are infected currently are going to be infected with one of those probably. Um, just another quick comment on that. Back in November, December, and even early in January, we were seeing um, deaths every day, one, two, sometimes three deaths yeah. um, every day. And it's so it's, it's um, I don't know what the right word is, I don't want to say nice, but it um, certainly has slowed down um, the number of deaths related to COVID-19, but also we've um, obviously had a, a significantly lower uh, population of COVID-19 patients in our hospital. Yeah, and I think it's important to know that on a community or regional or uh, state or national level, it's important to understand the prevalence of these variants and what is infecting where and in what communities. But on an individual level, uh, it's not going to be too important. It's not going to change what we're doing as far as if you come in and you need antiviral therapy with remdesivir, you're going to get it. If you meet criteria for steroids and some of those other adjunct treatments, you're going to get those, and of course you're going to be getting the uh, blood thinner as well. So individually, for you as a patient, it's not going to matter too much. 
All right. Are children at risk for suffering long haul symptoms from COVID-19, even if they had a mild case of COVID-19? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the best evidence that we have right now, the best research would say, yes, they are still at risk of suffering from symptoms of long COVID, even with a mild case. Um, you know, we can further elucidate that maybe if we have some of our Children's Mercy colleagues and our pediatric colleagues on, Dr. Lewis or Dr. Lauer. All right. I read there is a case study underway for transplant patients offering them a third dose of COVID-19. If the first and second shots are not working, how will a third dose help? Yeah, I mean, I think just representation of those antigens to that immunosuppressed patient, maybe um, to help, again, kickstart some of those cells uh, that may have reacted to the first and second, but not to those levels that we see in non-immunosuppressed patients. Uh, right now, I believe the um, the best recommendation in the transplant society, and this is based on expert opinion, is to continue with just the two doses. Uh, we know that it can still offer a little bit of benefit, but I think that these studies that are looking at third doses are extremely important. Um, I believe that third doses or more will be totally safe. Just uh, will it provide more protection? I think this is a good question to ask. This is a good study that's uh, undergoing, and hopefully we'll have results in the not too far future. Is the health system worried about expiration dates on vaccines running out? How are you managing all of this? Mm -hmm. So I think it's not just our health system, but others that are um, dealing with their inventory with an impending expiration date. I know, um, I think I saw earlier in the week or maybe last week, um, an extension on some of the um, expiration dates. Um, but we do work with our county and state health departments to kind of shift our inventory if possible to get to locations that might be running short or if there's big events that are coming um, to try and get those um, off the shelf as soon as possible. You know, our, our biggest uh, concern really is that we're running out of arms and so it's really mm -hmm. trying to get folks um, in situations where they can get their vaccine because we have plenty of inventory. Yeah. Is it possible to get a T-cell test for antibodies? I'm sure we've all had COVID-19 mm -hmm. in the past, but our <laughs> yeah. test came back negative. Yeah, so I believe there is now a commercial uh, test to look at a T-cell response, and this will tell you if you've ever had exposure to the virus. Um, that was how it was marketed. I don't know how it will interact now if you've had the vaccine. Um, but T cells are not tests for antibodies. Antibody is a separate test. Um, in general, there is no real commercially available test for T cell function and immune function, but I believe now there is a commercial test available just to, to have a T cell test to see if you've ever had exposure to the virus. Um, of note, you know, after my first dose of vaccine, I did get tested for antibodies. Um, and it was negative. Uh, now, the antibodies that we were using here at the health system, the antibody test at that time, only tested for antibodies to the N protein, uh, which is only found on the virus. It would not include um, the spike protein antibodies that are found that you made from the vaccine. So when I did get the test, I was negative, so I knew I had really never had exposure to the virus at all and was never infected. Uh, but to answer your question about the T cell, I think there is a commercial T cell test available. It will only tell you if you've had exposure to the virus at all um, throughout the pandemic, um, but that is a separate test for, from antibodies. When vaccines are altered to cover the variants, is it adding to the existing vaccine coverage mm -hmm. or is it just for the variant? Yeah, so it will be adding um, to the, um, the overall coverage. Uh, it will probably further optimize your um, antibodies to any of that uh, variant spike proteins. But what we do know, uh, thankfully, is that we still mount good T cell responses and have those T cell responses to the spike protein because even though there has been changes in the spike of those variants, a lot of those changes are occurring in that area that binds to the receptor on your body, but there are further T cell epitopes or rec uh, areas that the T cells recognize that are conserved, meaning they haven't changed. So you still have a good response by the T cells to those initial vaccines. And that is what we have seen because even with a third dose of the regular mRNA vaccine that we've already gotten, 
you still have very good protection. So I think it's just going to be able to optimize your antibody response to any of these certain variants that the, um, that the spike protein is, is pivoted to at that time. And I believe Moderna is looking at a, um, a South African variant booster or a third dose right now. Okay, and the next question I think we already answered, does the health system test for variants among its COVID-19 inpatients? Mm -hmm. We do, but it's at a limited basis. It's not every single patient. And I meant to look, I had just recently, we'd had an email conversation with Dr. Rachel Leesman, our director of micro, um, and she had provided um, the breakdown of the number of tests that we've sent for variant testing. Um, we don't always get the result yeah. back mm -hmm. um, to our lab because it doesn't ne necessarily change anything from a treatment perspective for our patients. The, the answer is yes, we do um, some testing, but it's not every single one of our, uh, our patients with a positive test. 14 states have reached 70% of adults vaccinated. Is that enough for herd immunity within those states? Or will the virus now push into other states more vigorously looking for people mm -hmm. to infect? So I think this is a tricky one. Yeah. Um, and again, I know we've talked about herd immunity and not having an exact black or white number yeah. for what is the percentage that's going to lead to herd immunity. Um, something else within those um, the states, and folks move from state to state, so um, you're kind of in flux mm -hmm. as a you know, there aren't boundaries as to COVID is going to move now from this state to this state. Um, so I think this is kind of a tricky question, and it's hard to say what is that percentage mm -hmm. that's going to lead to herd immunity and really help impact um, or reduce the spread. Yeah, I think there's a lot of intricacies and details in that. You know, you always want more people immune or vaccinated as possible. That will help reduce anybody who is not immune. Uh, we do know in households that um, vaccinated people do uh, pose greater protection to those unvaccinated in the households. And we've even seen a reduction of infection in those people who aren't vaccinated in households. But of course, if you're going out to big events and you're indoors or doing those risky things, uh, and a majority of the people aren't vaccinated, uh, then certainly it can spread that way. So there are a lot of details. Just understand that the more people that are vaccinated or immune, the better for herd immunity. But we, we do understand that in those uh, smaller areas like households, vaccinated people can even protect those unvaccinated people from uh, the risk of getting infected as well. A report published by Fair Health shows the odds of death at 30 days after being diagnosed with COVID-19 is 45 times higher among people hospitalized with COVID. That is alarming. What causes them to die? And is COVID-19 considered the cause? Wow. Okay. So I'm not familiar with this particular report. Um, and I think this is, this is again, going to be something tricky without mm -hmm. looking at what the details yeah. are of the report. Um, just even as we reported earlier today that um, our COVID-19 death monitoring isn't necessarily related to the cause of death. Um, we know the long haul syndrome. We know um, that there are other conditions that follow with the active COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, so I, I, I would probably just want to look a little bit further into the details of this report before providing a, a specific answer to this, um, but it it seems like it could be plausible. Yeah, and I, I'm familiar with other uh, studies and articles showing that your risk of hospitalization and death is increased after COVID. Your risk of getting new diagnoses like um, cardiovascular issues like hypertension or endocrinology issues like diabetes is increased after you have COVID-19, especially if you have some of the more uh, higher, moderate, or severe disease, your risk of having these diagnoses after you get out of the hospital is much higher if you've had COVID. Um, I have seen, again, similar studies that show that, yeah, if you are hospitalized with COVID and, and you get out, your risk of being hospitalized again, having further medical problems or death is greater than if you weren't hospitalized with COVID-19. And that is why it is all the more important to, to get vaccinated. So. Okay, just a couple of things before we say, that was our last printing mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Jamie wants everybody to know there's a Juneteenth celebration at Franklin Park in Prairie Village from noon to four on Saturday, and it is put on by Stand Up for Black Lives PV and the NPV and the NAACP of Johnson County. So Jamie, thank you for that. Peggy wants to know if you have a rash two months after your second Pfizer vaccine, is that an extreme reaction? 
Yeah, I think that's a little bit further out. Um, you know, there certainly are other causes of rashes, a lot of other causes. Um, we have seen a delay in a rash uh, type uh, issue by seven days, I think maybe more so for the Moderna um, than the Pfizer, but I could be wrong on that. But I think two months out, I think you need to look at other causes and other etiologies for that. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. She says she ended up getting her vaccine as a result of the update. Yeah. She said, I may have gotten it eventually anyway, but this program actually made me get excited to get it. Um, and she goes on to talk about the reasons why, but it's just talking about yeah. the, the numbers. And we, we appreciate mm -hmm. that feedback so much. A couple of more um, comments. Uh, just two more. Sharon says, does a vaccine prevent long haul syndrome if a fully vaccinated person contracts a mild case of COVID is, or is asymptomatic? Do you have any data on that? I don't think we have any data. I think we are anticipating and believe it will reduce, just as it reduces the full spectrum of COVID-19 disease, it will reduce your risk of having any of those long haul COVID symptoms. So, you know, I think that is one of the other questions that's being investigated. Um, we know that early on in the pandemic, um, I think maybe as of April 2020, we first started seeing those reports of long haul COVID. So hopefully now coming up with the vaccinations, there will be those questions answered about are you at reduced risk of getting long COVID? And if you have long COVID and you get the vaccination, do you have a chance that some of those symptoms may go away? And I think those questions are being investigated right now. So. Yeah, I say data, you say data. And when you say data, I, say I, think, I think of Star Trek. Right. Oh, I did it for <laughs> Dr. Sykes, he's not here. All right, yeah. last question goes to Ann. Okay. And Ann, I apologize. Anytime we do numbers, we should always put them up on the screen. So we will work ahead of time on this just oh. a little bit so we can help. Wow. Back to the fully vaccinated <laughs> question. Sure, Logan and Anthony are happy about that. So you have three fully vaccinated and two partially vaccinated? Correct. 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 One of those fully vaccinated is asymptomatic. So they didn't know, they came in for something Correct. else, yeah. and you found out, oh, yeah. you have COVID, and they were just as surprised as you. Yeah, yes. and one of those partially vaccinated is on active chemotherapy as well. Right, so, so they're likely their shot didn't maybe take. Well, and again, they're partially vaccinated, so they probably aren't at full immunity anyways. Yeah. Right. And I think it's important, and you might have to help me articulate this, because what I don't want viewers to think is because we're seeing now hospitalized patients who are fully vaccinated, that the vaccine isn't effective. Um, yeah. We know that there are more vaccinated folks out in the community. We know that um, testing numbers are no longer our way to monitor community transmission. And so we're really looking now for those increases in hospitalizations to suggest that community transmission still exists. Um, just like within our organization, we know that there are um, increases in hospitalizations across the state. Um, so I think, and I don't, again, I might need you to help me yeah. phrase this, but it doesn't mean just because we have some of our inpatients who are being treated for active COVID-19 and they're fully vaccinated, it doesn't mean that the vaccine isn't effective. We, we would expect that yeah. there would be mm -hmm. some in the population yeah. who still require hospitalization, even though the vaccine does protect many from, from requiring that hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, who am I not seeing on this list? Uh, it is those nursing home patients and those patients, mm -hmm. you know, over 65. Right now we have two that are over 65. So other than that, it's younger than 65 people. So it is that lack of those people that are, we are seeing, those first individuals that were vaccinated uh, when the vaccination was rolled out that we are not seeing in the hospital. And that is showing us that it continues to work and helps decrease the overall spectrum of disease. And if you look at the numbers the other way, 75% mm -hmm. are not vaccinated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jean has a really great question, and Jean, I'm gonna save it for Monday. <laughs> it is gonna open up this big conversation. Great question, tune in Monday. <laughs> Uh-oh, okay. Well, and with that, Monday we are going to have a panel of teenagers who all made the decision to get vaccinated. We are going to hear who influenced them why they made the decision to get the shot, and how did they feel, and what do their peers think. Uh, we're also going to talk about how virtual learning impacted their mental health and grades. Should be very enlightening. I do feel, you know, I had to do my recertification a year ago for infectious disease, it's every 10 years. 
typically we go to a conference to do that and in person and it's three or four hundred people we had to do it virtually last year and it was very difficult sitting in classes for eight hours a day so I definitely um, understand what, what the kids were going through so I want to say um, you know thank you to our guests Broderick any final thoughts so uh, again it's always a pleasure to uh, sit with you Dr. Hawkinson uh, a couple of things one that as you guys were going through the conversation some of the things that we're doing I'm also part of the Wyandotte Health Equity Task Force. And some of the things that we're doing now is we're incentivizing organizations, faith-based uh, faith organizations, community organizations, and churches to increase testing. And so we are, even though testing is down, as, as Jill has indicated, we're still pushing people to get tested uh, because we know that that's one of the ways that we can determine how things are moving within our community. Second thing that I'll mention is that it is very important to continue to push folks to get vaccinated. We know that we, I believe in Kansas, we're only at 25, 26%. And so we still have a large group of people that are in what we call the movable middle to get to vaccinations. Mm -hmm. And so we're continuing to have those conversations with folks in our churches and folks in our communities. And then finally, we want to address the hesitancy. What is causing that? Why is that fear there? And what can we do to effectively communicate the right process for them to understand the importance of getting vaccinated? Thanks again, and always a pleasure. Yeah, Chaplain Miller, final thoughts. Uh, once again, just wanna say thank you for uh, having me on here. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about this. And just like uh, Roderick here, our church also, we're pushing a number of things to mm. try to pe keep people educated mm -hmm. uh, and getting those vaccines. And I yeah. think that is very healthy for all of us. And so uh, once again, just wanna say thank you. Thank you. Yep. Amanda. And to continue with the theme of um, being grateful, I want to thank both of you for um, coming on and sharing um, the information that you did. It sounds just um, like there's some great events happening this weekend. And on Sunday, I know it's also Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all the, the dads out there. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Please go out and celebrate in a healthy manner and do things outside. You know, if you are outside, I think it'll be warm. Hydrate, wear sunscreen, you know, be healthy if you can. Go get vaccinated, and we will see you on Monday. Oh, so <laughs> and as we say goodbye, uh, one more look at the meaning and importance of celebrating Juneteenth from some uh, others here at the health system. So, again, be safe this weekend. Get vaccinated. Hydrate. If you're outside, wear sunscreen um, and enjoy this, this last video. The elephant's already been, it's been in the room. The question is, is, is are we gonna finally uh, have a chance to recognize it? Communities across Kansas are, are recognizing this day. I recognize that I need to learn from you. I want to do right. And I need you to help me to know how to do right. And I think we all need to be thoughtful today on June T. But moving forward, we have to get through this and we have to seek justice and, and do it through love. The African-American community has seen those circumstances time and time again without sufficient change. My goal, our goal as Americans should be that we use these, these moments to uh, have a consequence that lasts longer than a moment. It's kind of hard to, to talk about this. I have, I have four kids, I have three boys. In the African-American community, we always talk about having to talk. We've had an incident with my, he's now 20 year old, who's plays football at Kansas State, pre-med student, 4.3 GPA, 30 ACT, gets uh, pulled over. He basically got spooked because the police officer had his hand on his gun. I need to listen, learn, and respond based upon what people who have experienced these circumstances know and suggest. We have to listen well. And what we really have to listen to is people telling us the truth, not tell us what we want to hear. Whether you're talking about masks, you're talking about race, you're talking about discrimination or health or pandemics or coronavirus, we got to talk truth.